we'll be reviewing IRS Form 8853, Archer MSAs and Long-Term Care Insurance Contracts. Now, this form is not that commonly used by most taxpayers, primarily because after December 31st, 2007, you cannot make a contribution to an Archer MSA unless you were an active Archer MSA participant prior to 2008 or you became an active MSA participant for a tax year ending after 2007 because of coverage that you have under a high deductible health plan of an Archer MSA participating employer. So the purpose of this tax form is to do several things. One, report Archer MSA contributions to include employer contributions. Two, calculate your Archer MSA deduction. Three, report distributions from Archer MSAs or Medicare Advantage MSAs. Four, report taxable payments from long-term care insurance contracts. And five, report taxable accelerated death benefits from a life insurance policy. You must file this tax form if any of the following conditions apply. One, you or your employer made contributions for the given tax year to your Archer MSA. Two, you're filing a joint tax return and your spouse or your spouse's employer made contributions for the tax year to your spouse's Archer MSA. Three, you or your spouse, if you're filing a joint tax return, acquired an interest in an Archer MSA or a Medicare Advantage MSA because of the death of the account holder. Four, you or your spouse, if you're filing a joint return, were a policyholder who received payments under a long-term care insurance contract or if you received any accelerated death benefits from a life insurance policy on a per diem or other periodic basis in the tax year. And finally, five, you or your spouse, if you're filing a joint return, received Archer MSA or Medicare Advantage MSA distributions in the tax year. If you or your spouse received an Archer MSA or Medicare Advantage MSA distribution in the tax year, then you must file Form 8853 with your tax return, even if you have no other taxable income. So we'll briefly review the form and then we'll come back to the top and go through step by step. So Section A is for Archer MSAs. If you only have a Medicare Advantage MSA, you can skip Section A, which contains Part 1, Part 2. Section 3 contains the Medicare Advantage MSA distributions. And then Section C on the back uh, covers long-term care insurance contracts. So let's go back to the top. At the top of this form, you'll see uh, your name and social security number of the MSA holder. If both spouses have uh, an Archer MSA, then uh, you enter the Social Security number that's shown first on your tax return. So in line one, you will enter your total employer contributions for the tax year. Line two, you will enter Archer MSA contributions that you made for the tax year to include any that were made in 2023 by the unextended due date of your tax return in 2022, but do not include rollover contributions. Line three, uh, you will calculate the limitation from the line three limitation chart shown in the instructions. And there is a a chart that walks you through what you should enter. Now, if for self-only coverage, you enter your deductible, which must be at least $2,450, but not more than $3,700. Family coverage, you'll enter your 
deductible in the worksheet of 4950, but not more than 7400. And based on that flow chart, you'll enter uh, the appropriate percentages, walk through the tax, uh, the uh, limitation chart in the worksheet, and then you'll enter the, the result into line three. For line four, you'll enter your, your total compensation for purposes of this tax form that includes wage, any wages, salaries, professional fees, and other pay that you receive for services that you perform. This can also include sales commissions, commissions on insurance premiums, pay based on a percentage of profits, tips, and bonuses. Compensation also includes net earnings from self-employment, but only for a trade or business in which your personal services are a material income producing factor. Compensation does not include anything from a pension or an annuity, and it does not include deferred compensation. In line five, you will enter the smallest of either lines two, three, or four in, into line five. You'll also enter that amount on line 23 from ske on schedule one for your form 1040. If line two, which contains the total MSA contributions you made for the tax year, is more than line five, which means that it's either more than the limitation that you calculated on the limitation chart, or and it's more than the compensation uh, from the instructions indicated on line four, you may need to pay an additional tax on your excess contributions. The instructions contain additional guidance on being able to uh, determine what to do with your excess contributions, either your contributions or your employer contributions. Under part two, we'll go over Archer MSA distributions uh, for the tax year. So in line 6A, you will enter the total distributions that you and your spouse receive from all Archer MSAs in the tax year. The, these amounts should be shown in box one of your form 1099-SA. 1099-SA should be the document that you receive if you have any Archer MSA distributions during the tax year. In line 6B, you'll include any distributions that you received that were rolled over. You can also include any excess contributions or earnings on those excess contributions that were included on line a, 6A that were withdrawn by the due date to include extensions of your tax return. For your knowledge, a rollover is considered to be a tax-free distribution or a withdrawal of assets from one Archer MSA that is reinvested in another Archer MSA or a health savings account, HSA, for the same account holder. Generally, you must complete the rollover within 60 days following the distribution. An Archer MSA and an HSA can receive only one rollover contribution in a one-year period. You can refer to IRS Publication 590A, Contribution to Individual Retirement Arrangements, or IRAs, for more details. Line 6C, simply subtract Line 6B from Line 6A and enter the difference. For Line 7, you'll enter unreimbursed qualified medical expenses for either yourself and your spouse, your dependents, or any person that would be a dependent except that person filed a joint tax return, had gross income of $4,400 or more, or if you or your spouse filing jointly are dependents of someone else. For line eight, you'll subtract line seven from line six C. If it's zero or less, you'll enter zero, and you'll, if there is a positive amount, you'll also include this amount in the total on schedule one, line eight E. For lines nine A and nine B, if any of the distributions that were included on line eight 
meet the exceptions to the additional 20% tax, then you'll check here. The additional 20% tax applies to Archer MSA distributions that are included in income unless there's an exception that applies. And the exceptions that apply include distributions made after the account holder dies, after the account holder becomes disabled, or after the account holder turns age 65. If any of those exceptions apply, then you check the box on nine, line 9A and you only enter the amount on line 9B, 20% of the amount on line 8 that does not meet the exceptions. And section B will cover Medicare Advantage MSA distributions. If you're filing a joint tax return and both you and your spouse received distributions in 2022 from a Medicare Advantage MSA, you'll need to complete a separate Section B for each spouse. And a Medicare Advantage MSA is simply an Archer MSA designated as a Medicare Advantage MSA solely to pay qualified medical expenses of the account holder. To be eligible for a Medicare Advantage MSA, you must be enrolled in Medicare and have a high deductible health plan that meets the Medicare guidelines. Contributions to the account can only be made by Medicare and the contributions and any earnings are not taxable to the account holder. Distributions are made exclusively to pay the qualified medical expenses of the account holder are not taxable. Any distributions that are not used for qualified medical expenses are included in gross income and may be subject to a penalty. So for line 10, you'll enter the total distributions that you received from all Medicare Advantage MSAs. Like an Archer MSA, these amounts should be shown in box one of your form 1099 SA. For line 11, you will enter the total distributions from all Medicare Advantage MSAs that were used only for the account holder's qualified medical expenses. You cannot take a deduction on Schedule A for any amount that you include on line 11. You'll subtract line 11 from line 10. This results in your taxable Medicare Advantage MSA distributions. If this number is zero or less, then you'll enter zero. If this number is a positive amount, you'll also include this amount in the total on Schedule 1, line 8E. If there are any exceptions to the additional 50% tax rule, uh, check the box in line 13A. These exceptions include if the account holder dies or becomes disabled. The age of 65 criteria does not apply here because you have to be age 65 to enroll in Medicare and you have to be enrolled in Medicare to have a Medicare Advantage MSA distribution. So any amount that is included on line 12 that is not ex does not qualify for an exception is subject to the additional 50% tax. You'll enter 50% of the distributions that you included on line 12 that do not apply to that an exception does not apply to. Section C, long-term care insurance contracts. So the instructions contain filing requirements for Section C. And if there is more than one Section C attached, you'll check the appropriate box. Now, a qualified long-term insurance contract is a contract issued after December 31st, 1996 that meets the requirements of Internal Revenue Code Section 7702B 
which includes the requirement that the insured must be a chronically and ill individual, or if it was a contract issued before January 1st, 1997, it was a contract that made, met state law requirements for long-term care insurance contracts at the time when and in the state where the contract was issued and the contract had not been changed materially. So when you refer to the flow chart for filing requirements on Section C, uh, this will help you determine how much of Section C or which parts are applicable to your situation. And if this applies, in line 14A, you'll enter the name of the insured. In 14B, you'll enter the Social Security number of the insured. And if each spouse has a long-term care contract for a joint return, then you'll need a complete Section C for each spouse. In line 15, there are special rules that apply to determine taxable payments if other individuals received per diem payments under this qualified contract. You can refer to the instruction, instructions that contain a section marked multiple payees. So if this applies, whether or not other individuals besides yourself received pay, payments on a per diem or other periodic basis, check yes or no. For 16, you'll check whether or not the individual was terminate, terminally ill. If the answer is yes, and the only payments received in the tax year were accelerated death benefits paid because of a terminal illness, you can skip lines 17 through 25, and then you will go to line 26 and enter zero, and that will be the end of your tax form. <clears throat> if that does not apply to you, then in line 17, you'll enter the gross long-term care payments received on a per diem or other periodic basis. This should be the total of the amounts from box one on all forms 1099-LTC you received with respect to the insured on which the per diem box in box three is checked. As a cautionary note, do not use lines 18 through 26 to figure the taxable amount of benefits paid under a long-term care insurance contract that is not a qualified contract. Instead, if the benefits are not excludable from income, then you'll report the income as not excludable on Schedule 1, line 8E, or if you are completing Form 1040-NR, you'll go to Schedule NEC, Line 12. For Line 13, you will enter the part of the amount on Line 17 from qualified long-term care insurance contracts. If you have more than one long-term care period, you must separately calculate the taxable amount of the payments received during each period, which means you'll have to complete lines 18 through 26 on separate section C for each long-term care period. Then you'll enter the total on long, line 26 and attach that form 8853 to your income tax return. For line 19, You'll enter any accelerated death benefits that you received on a per diem or periodic basis. However, you will not include any amounts received because of a terminal illness. These amounts should be shown on box two of your form 1099 LTC. For line 20, you'll add lines 18 and 19 come to the result. If you checked yes on line 15 above, which is whether or not a person other than the designated payee received payments on a per diem or other periodic basis, if that is applicable, then 
you should refer to the multiple payees section in the instructions before you complete lines 21 through 25. If that does not apply and you proceed to line 21, then you'll multiply $390 by the number of days in the long-term care period for the tax year. Now the long-term care period number of days depends on which payment you choose to def which method you choose to define the long-term care period. You can choose between a contract period or the equal payment rate method. Special rules apply, however, if other persons also receive per diem payments under a qualified long-term care insurance contract or as accelerated death benefits and you'll have to refer to the multiple, multiple payee section. Under method one, the contract period, the long-term care period is the same period used by the insurance company under the contract to compute the benefits paid to you. So if the insurance company computes your benefits on a daily basis, your long-term care period is one day. And if you choose this method for defining your long-term care periods, and there are different long-term care insurance contracts for the same person using different contract periods, then all contracts must be treated as using a daily basis. Under the equal payment rate, which is method two, your long-term care period is the period during which the insurance company uses the same payment rate to compute your methods, your benefits. For example, if you have two long-term care periods, if the insurance contract computes rates at a pay rate of $175 per day from March 1st through May 31st, and then $195 per day from June 1st through December 31st, the first long-term care period it would be 92 days, the second would be 214 days. You can choose the equal payment rate method even if you have more than one qualified long-term care insurance contract covering the same period. For line 22, you'll enter the costs incurred for qualified long-term care services provided during the period. And according to the instructions, qualified long-term care services are necessary diagnostic, preventive, preventative, therapeutic, curing, treating, mitigating, and rehabilitative services, and maintenance or personal care services that are required to treat a chronically ill individual under a plan of care prescribed by a licensed healthcare practitioner. For line 23, you'll enter the larger of line 21 or 22. For line 24, you'll enter any reimbursements that you received or expect to receive through your insurance or otherwise for qualified long-term care services provided during the long-term care periods in question. These should be indicated in box three of form 1099 LTC if these payments were made on a reimbursement basis. For line 25, you'll subtract line 24 from line 23. This simply is your per diem limitation. Line 26, you'll subtract line 25 from line 20. If this number is zero or less, you'll enter zero. You have no taxable payments. Any positive amount, you'll also include in the total on Schedule 1, Line 8E, or if you are filing Form 1040NR, you'll include that on Schedule NEC, Line 12. If this applies to you, you will write on Line 12, LTC, and the amount. That brings us to the end of this article on IRS Form 8853, Archer MSAs. Medicare Advantage MSAs, and long-term care insurance contracts. 
If you have more questions, please post them in the comments section. We've also written an article, which you can read. Simply go to our website, teachmepersonalfinance.com, type in IRS Form 8853 in the search bar, and our article should appear. Please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our newsletter, and if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much.